this week on the Back Table Podcast. It's incredible where we're at now. And I think it's important to take some time to understand the beauty of these products. There's a lot of effort that goes into these. If you ever go visit any of these companies and see how these things are made, which a lot of people should do if you get into this, it's incredible what goes on when you just open this little thing and, you know, not me, but somebody drops it and are like, oh, let's give me another one. You don't think about what all went into that process. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. No matter what treatment or diagnostic procedure you use, you need to get to Target Anatomy. Cook Medical has a full spectrum of access sets, introducers, wires, catheters, and accessories to help you get there. Find out how Cook Medical can support your procedures from start to finish with devices that fit your clinical needs and preferences to help you achieve better outcomes. To learn more, reach out to your local rep today, visit our website, or follow Cook Vascular on Twitter and LinkedIn. Now, back to the episode. Today, we've got a great episode lined up. We're going to be talking about catheter shapes, when to use what, and how to know when to switch out in challenging cases. We're going to talk a little bit about the basics and then kind of get into some more advanced tips and tricks for more challenging cases. I'm joined by a longtime friend of the show and recurrent guest, Kumar Manasari. Kumar, welcome back, bud. Great to be back. Thank you. And um, one of his residents at Rush, Dr. Shelly Banot. Shelly, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Welcome guys. So first of all, let us know where you're at, what your practice looks like. And then Shelly, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the Rush VIR residency program, but uh, Kumar, I'll start with you and then we'll go to Shelly. So, uh, you know, it's great to be back again, Aaron, the whole team. It's incredible to see uh, how big you guys have gotten over the years. It's incredible branching out to every specialty. So kudos to everybody. For my practice, I'm at Chicago at Rush University Medical Center. We're a tertiary academic center in the city, and we also have another hospital nearby at Oak Park. My practice now over the years has evolved to primarily an outpatient practice involving limb preservation. However, I also run the IVC filter clinic. You know, me and my partners and our team, we do quite a bit of the complex hepatobiliary, cancers, research, clinical trials, and all that. So uh, we're lucky to be where we are in the best city in America. I don't want to hear anybody argue about it. And uh, we have an incredible residency program. I think we still have the biggest IR residency program with about 27 trainees. So we've been fortunate to grow and build and have the volume to support that. So there's not a day that goes by where we don't come up with something we don't know what to do and we improvise. So that's the beauty of our job and why we love it. But uh, thanks again for having me. I didn't realize you guys were the biggest program. I think so. For a few years, we were the biggest. And now that we've graduated... Now, you know, the now officially the first matched residency classes are graduating. So um, it's been a fun ride to watch this IRDR combination and where it goes in the future. It's been great to develop really IR focused residents rather than just having them for one year as a fellow. So we do have the volume to support that. I'm sure Shelly uh, can tell you her sleepless days. Yeah. So I'm a PGY6. I'm in my sixth and final year of the IRDR integrated residency. At Rush, it's structured kind of similar to a lot of the integrated residencies where your first year is a categorical surgical year. So you do a general surgery internship, then you do three years of diagnostic radiology, um, and then you go for two years in your IR fellowship years. But what makes our DR years pretty unique is our residency as a whole is really clinically focused. So we spend a lot of time in the surgical ICU even sometimes in the medical ICU. During COVID especially, because we're such clinical residents, we were actually pulled to help with the COVID ICUs before most of the other residents in the hospital. So we're just very clinically focused in our residency, which has been really nice because getting that extra background in our training has helped with scary clinical situations when you're in a procedure room and you don't know what to do. All that time in an ICU has helped us a lot kind of know what to do in tricky situations. So that's been really helpful. And I love it. I'm sad it's my last year, honestly. But yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, that's great, Chelly. Versus most of us out, we're just wait for the code team to show up. You're probably taking action right there when things happen. So that's good. You know, Aaron, I'll add to that. It's pretty cool because there are times when we are admitting our own patients to the ICU and the resident taking care of the patient ICU is one of our own IR residents. So I think that's a very 
awesome, unique camaraderie, family, and like trust work. You know, a lot of times we think about all the crazy stuff we do. We go, like, oh, let's send this patient to the ICU for X, Y, Z. Then you have to explain things. When we have certain resident, you know, that's on our team, like, hey, we just did this. Take care of it. You know, it's kind of it's great because the 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 knowledge base, the understanding, and they're part of their teams in the ICUs. They build that network with us for everybody. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, for today's topic, we're going to be kind of going back to the the basics a little bit. And Kumar and I talked about this, you know, what we wanted to accomplish with this episode in terms of getting some practical high yield information out there, both for somebody who's still in training, but also for docs out in practice who maybe, especially me in private practice, I mean, there's three catheters that I use 99% of the time, right? And we'll get into that. But I would like to learn about the other ones. And I would like to know when to pull what in challenging cases, because a lot of times I'm just kind of looking at the shapes or I'm going over to the cardiac cath lab and seeing what they have. But we wanted to kind of share some knowledge around catheter shapes and when to use what. And we're going to start with anatomy. But first, I want to talk a little bit about names and shapes, because it is kind of challenging to learn the names because there's a lot, there's some eponyms and there's also just like random you know, C1, C2, Cobras, and so forth, they can be a little bit confusing. They can be hard to keep straight. What's the best way to learn them? Kumar, how did you kind of learn them? Obviously, probably over time with experience, but, you know, maybe you guys have an advice for trainees who are currently trying to learn these names of different catheter shapes. Yeah, I think think it can be very daunting uh, when you think about how many types of catheters there are out there. And then sometimes there are some that are borrowed from one of the other interventional specialties such as cardiology or neurointerventional. So I think it's important to realize that, you know, in the beginning, you're not going to understand all of them. And a lot of what we understand at this level, we've had to do through experience and learning. And I think one of the ways is when you're a, a trainee, go to your area of your supplies, your stocks and your teams and go just start looking. I used to do that as a as a resident. I'd say, I just walk down and say, I'd pull those uh, omni cell sleeves up. I'd be like, what is this? And then sometimes you can ask a tech, say, hey, what are the ones we use most commonly? Or when you have downtime, ask your attendings and say, hey, when do you use this thing? Honestly, the ability to use each one in certain situations comes with practice. So I think I told some of the residents, Shelly, this, like, whenever we give you that leeway to do a case or to start a case on your own and do some of it when you're in the upper levels, you're allowed to ask for certain things and kind of see how it feels, see how it works. And you have to kind of get that tactile and visual feedback. So I think it's a it's a combination of going, learning on your own a little bit, learn the name, see what they are. Even though there's several different companies that make these catheters, most of them have all the same shape name. And a lot of them come from physicians who founded or designed those types of catheter shapes. So they're all going to be a SIM, an H1, a Cobra, uh, a Mick, a Mickelson, or Bernstein, and whatever you have. I mean, so in the grand scheme of things, there's maybe, even though, Aaron, we use like three commonly, there's probably about 10 that we know how to use where and when, when you think of it that way. Yeah, exactly. And, and as we go through the anatomy, we'll, we'll probably get into those 10. Before we do that, Shelly, any tips that you can recommend for fellow trainees on how you've learned these catheter shapes over time? I'll definitely say, I remember many years ago going to SIR and there was a big panel of just pictures of different catheters. And at the time, I remember thinking, I can't believe that one day I'm going to know what these catheters are. And I think about that all the time when now I'm working with juniors and I ask for something and the junior hasn't seen that catheter before. And I think most of it comes with experience, Um, especially a lot of us, if we're in between cases, we try to jump into other cases in other rooms, um, especially if the attending's there, because every attending asks for different catheters. And That's also a really nice way to get exposure to different catheters and different ways to use them. Yeah, you're right. And it's kind of like wires. Everybody has their preference. Like Kumar was saying, it's tactile. You develop those feel over time with use. It's a lot of trial and error. But I did like your advice, Kumar, because I did the same thing where I'll go into the stock room and just look at what's on the wall or even just in the cabinets and look and see, okay, because I go to some of these little community hospitals where they don't have much, if I get a challenging case, I, I want to know what I have at hand. Because if there's not much on hand, I'm not going to put that patient in a bad situation, right? So I like to do that is look at the cabinets. I think that's an incredible point because, you know, what you get to expose and use in training is going to kind of help you when you start your new job. When, like Aaron just said, you you may not have that supply source. So then you have to start 
asking and fighting for supplies that you need and you want that you're comfortable with. And the only way to do that is having a kind of a good, well-rounded experience of all the different types and brands or whatever have you. So I think the training time is when you get your hands on to play with whatever you want for the most part. Yeah. And before we get into the actual shapes and we're going to start at the aortic arch, Kumar, if you can just kind of explain for the younger audience, like what is a beacon tip and why is it important when it comes to a catheter? Yeah, so beacon tip, it's one of the uh, parts of Cook catheters that were uh, around for quite a bit of years. In between the 2000s, they had a, late 2000s had a recall because of some issues with the beacon tip, but it was a very visible, really nicely torquable type of catheter that was a kind of a workhorse for a lot of us. Um, it had like, I think it was a tungsten based tip. And so you could see it very well on fluoroscopy and it had a kind of a, a little bit of lubricity to it, which is a term that we use obviously in catheters. And the ability to kind of visualize where you're going and to hook arteries very easily, especially in the larger patients, which we see in our society, it was really beneficial. And then there was a little bit of a, a gap in the late 2000 when they had to restructure the tip and uh, they brought it back with a little bit of vengeance. And I think it's starting uh, back to where a lot of us get to use what we're very comfortable with. So it's a great workhorse type of catheter that you can see, which is one of the hardest things uh, in the middle of a complex case, patients coding, dying, and you can't see your catheter. Right, exactly. And, you know, then there's hydrophilic catheters, which tend not to be beacon tip, right? And just for the audience, we're going to talk about base catheters today. We're not going to be talking about micro catheters. That's a whole nother discussion. But I do want to talk a little bit about when and why we would use a full-on hydrophilic catheter, not just the tip. Yeah, I mean, I think the great thing, and to understand the concept, especially for the younger trainees people who may be listening, is that the base catheter gives you that support. So when I use, you know, a Cobra or a Sim or a Berenstein, those are to get you support into the origin of whatever artery you're doing. However, sometimes even from a base catheter standpoint, you want to get a little bit further to get a little more distal, especially when you're doing microcatheter work, or if you're doing a PAD and you're trying to cross tight lesions, the hydrophilic catheters are very lubricious and very slick. So they tend to pass very easily and a lot better than the non-hydrophilic catheters through tight areas, through turns, and through areas where you can do that a little more safely. Now, the downside of that is you don't have a ton of support with that catheter when you're advancing things. So when you're advancing through a, let's say, a four French glide cath or a five French glide cath, and you're pushing a vascular plug or you're passing something else through it, even a stiff wire, those catheters will buckle back because they don't have the support. But a, a beacon tip catheter and the other braided strong catheters they'll hold their own. So that's the caveat. You'll get a lot further and through tough lesions with the hydrophilic. However, you won't have the same support if you're in a very tortuous segment as the other base catheters. So are you tending to use like a longer sheath if you know you're going to use a hydrophilic catheter? Yeah. So like a lot of the, the interventional oncology cases, when you're doing a uh, liver directed therapy and you want to get your microcatheter, you know, 200 centimeters into the weeds, a lot of those times I'll take a sheath into the origin of the visceral and then a four French glide hydrophilic catheter further into the main visceral artery and then the micatheter. That way, when you're making these 10, 20 turns, you have triaxial support in a sense. And I think that's where the beauty of combining all these and understanding which catheters where, when, and how comes in. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for explaining all that. So we're going to start at the top. Shelly, are you guys in your program doing much in many neuro cases? We do have a neuro elective where we get to go and learn a lot of their techniques there. And we do, I wouldn't say we have really high volume, but we've had cases where we go into the external carotid and, you know, lingual artery embolization, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, obviously upper extremity cases, subclavians. So let's talk a little bit about getting access into the major branch vessels off the aortic arch. Can you walk through what, what's your go-to? So especially in the aortic arch and the subclavian, like a lot of times you want to start in terms of wire with something that's really hydrophilic and soft, like a glide wire. But with subclavians especially, I've seen, you know, just something as simple as a Berenstein catheter can kind of get you where you need to go um, with a glide wire. Also a SIM, a SIM catheter, a SIM 1, SIM 2 can be used. That reverse curve can help you get into some tough origins. Yeah, I feel like those are kind of our go-tos in the beginning. Yeah. Do you ever just try a straight vert with any of the brain? Like that's what I always was taught to just try a vert at least first. Because a, a Berenstein and a vert are similar shapes, right? 
Um, so it's kind of the same concept, but um, Shelly, talk through the challenge of, of a sim, right? Yeah, the sim, it's a bigger curve. So it requires some advanced techniques in terms of forming it. Um, one of which is you can form it, you know, over the arch and like kind of through the valve, the aortic valve a little bit and pull it back. Or you have to form it over the aortic arch in the abdomen. Um, but not all aortas are big enough to accommodate that. So that can be the most challenging part because it's a bigger curve. Yeah, exactly. That's why I always, I never start with a sim. I always try with something basic <laughs> yeah. first. And maybe because we're in the, we're in the arch, let's talk about forming reverse curves real quick. Kumar, any, I mean, you do this a lot. What is your sort of algorithm for forming a reverse curve, whether it be a sim or even just something as simple as an omni sauce? I think in the arterial system, the arch is going to be the area where you're going to probably have the best success with it forming. I mean, the sim has that kind of three curves. You have the primary, secondary, tertiary. So it's got a huge sweeping arch and the sim two and sim three have compared to the one have more of a kind of a back arch on the first curve. So that's the main differences. And what that does is those help you anchor in the bigger aortas. Cause as you're going, a lot of times, if you tried, let's say just a, a regular Berenstein or revert, sometimes where the aorta is and where your catheter is sitting, whether you have tortuosity and all that stuff as you get older, it might be hard to get it to turn and angle in certain ways. So having that double curve to the front two part of it helps. So what I use typically is an exchange wire into the ascending arch area and then advance a catheter. And then as you pull the wire and you twist, usually it'll form that angle where the tip is already pointed towards the great vessels. Some of them are kind of meant for when you have like a type three arch and such, but I think in my algorithm, it's the same as what you both were saying. The vert is pretty much a long Berenstein. So it's just in a, a longer length of it. So using that first where you're, you bring the, the angled catheter into the arch and you start pulling back and twisting with the wire, sometimes you find it. If not that, sometimes a headhunter is a little bit easier because it doesn't have such a big double turn. And so you can use the headhunter, advance it to the ascending, pull the wire and twist it as you pull back. And a lot of times it'll catch your subclavian or carotids or whatever you're trying to get into. So I think for me, the tree goes Berenstein or vert, usually the vert then an H1, then a sim, because a sim, like we're talking about, just takes a little bit more effort and you're kind of spinning and twisting and there's plaque there. So in my head, I'm always like, if I'm going to spin and twist and pull something, I kind of don't want to do it too much where it's going to the brain, just personal preference. Um, so I try one of the others first. In the venous system, you could always form it over the iliac veins. You could also form the sim in the arterial over the iliac arteries and then go all the way up. But I think over the arch is typically where most of us do it. Let me guess what you're doing, using a, a sim for in the venous system, maybe an adrenal vein sampling? Yeah, the bane of existence of IRs is the adrenal veins. Uh, <laughs> the dreaded adrenal vein sampling. Yeah, especially that left adrenal vein. Um, when you hook it into the renal vein and you pull it down, it almost always finds that adrenal vein, uh, whether you want it or not. Exactly. I think it's a great job of like just the basics of aortic arch branches and, you know, the neuro guys probably have more tips and tricks just cannulating those carotids and, and verts. But I mean, look at all these MSK interventions that are coming now with the shoulder embolization and whatnot. So we might find ourselves trying to access these subclavians a lot more often. I think one thing to remember for trainees to kind of visualize in their head is once you have your reverse curve in the arch, you're actually pulling the catheter down for the tip to go forward. And you kind of have to visualize that in your head or see it where you now have a reverse curve catheter you're not going to advance the catheter more for it to go into the arteries. You're actually pulling the catheter down. So as you pull it down, that big looping curve is actually straightening out. So the tip is going forward in the artery that you're selecting. Exactly. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the thoracic aorta, right? Also a place where we may need reverse curve, especially for bronchioles, bronchial artery embolization. And even in the case of thoracics, where you might have like a spinal lesion that needs to be embolized. Shelly, can you talk us through bronchial artery embolization, how you're getting that base catheter to select those? Yeah. Uh, actually, Dr. Magisteri and I had one together not that long ago, and he was like, you have 30 minutes. Let's see what works. And and it's actually a really- <laughs> patient, patient was stable. Patient was, oh, yeah. Patient was stable. <laughs> patient was stable. Yeah. Um, and that was extremely valuable because that was exactly as Dr. Magisteri was saying earlier, a really great time for me to figure out why some of our basic go-to catheters are our go-to catheters. 
So um, first we had, I had the sauce. Uh, you tried, the sauce is kind of like a nice reverse curve that, and it's a double curve that helps you. It can find the bronchioles in some situations for some patients. But in this patient, it wasn't as easy. Like the sauce wasn't finding the branches that I needed. And so I ended up switching over for a Mickelson. And the Mickelson is kind of one of the classic catheters when it comes to looking for bronchioles. It has multiple curves that kind of gives you nice stability when you do eventually hook into a bronchial. Those are my go-tos to begin with. That's a great tip. I Mickelsons are hard to find on the cabinets in a lot of these, you know, community hospitals. And so I've always been stuck with Cobra, you know, try it first with a Cobra, but a lot of times Cobra is not, it, you know, just given the angle of those bronchioles and then the width of the thoracic aorta, it's a little bit different from the abdominal aorta. It, it just can be challenging with a Cobra. And so, you know, then I try something like a, you know, sauce and usually have success with that. But I think the Miggleson's actually a great suggestion. Uh, I just wish it was more rarely available. Yeah, it's nice because that has a tapered tip. So if you are able to get into it, it's not like you have the non-tapered larger hole going into your small bronchial arteries so, or lumbars, whatever you're doing. Um, the issue I see with some of those that we have difficulties when you have a tortuous aortoiliac system, because what happens is when you're, when you get your axis and you're going up, you're fighting the curves that your pathway has. So if your catheter is going through a very tortuous iliac artery into an aorta now, that catheter is going to favor one side of the aortic wall and it may never hook the way you want to the side you're going. So, you know, in those situations, maybe something with a larger reverse curve, a sim, or even if you put a sheath in the iliac artery all the way up to aorta, that provides a straight path for then your catheters to do a lot better. So those are things you'll combat, but a Mickelson or even a sauce, I think, Cobra as well, but the Cobra has the same problem if there's very lot of tortuosity. So I think those are three that typically we would use for those type of areas. That's actually a great point, Kumar, is to keep an eye on what the iliac anatomy looks like, because you're right, that's going to push you one way or the other. And I don't think I realized that until I was later in practice. And I'm like, you know, scratching my head, like, why am I not able to get into this? And it's because you're just being pushed due to the, that tortuous anatomy. So I guess it would be kind of the same for the thoracics, right? I mean, it's not often I have to access the thoracics, but it kind of comes off in a similar angle as the bronchioles. But would you just go with the same thing for a thoracic? I think the thing is like a lot of times it's a little bit of just twist, pull, advance, pull, see what you hook. It, it's a nuance to, to understand that what you're looking for is that catheter tip to suddenly deflect. And that's your sign that you're into something because you can't really do roadmaps in the thoracic aorta looking for bronchioles or thoracic, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible just because all the motion that's there, but, um, you're just watching for the nuance of that catheter. And, uh, you know, as trainees, remember that you're looking at a 2d visual picture, not a 3d. So it's, it's important to remember that you could be on the wrong side of the artery. You know, it's very important to think about that nuance, Aaron, you remember, and I'm sure Shelly, like, how do you know you're anterior? That's like, you can probably remember your, anterior, your attendee saying, you're not anterior. How do you know you're anterior? <laughs> it's like, right. Yeah. Yeah. And you just got to turn and see which way you're turning. It's a clock, you know? <laughs> yeah. If you, you just had to remember if you're standing on the bottom of the patient or the top of the patient, and when you turn the catheter one way outside, which way should it turn on your screen? Remember, just like radiology, it's the opposite. So you have to think about that every time. Exactly. And, and the other key thing, and I learned this in fellowship, was the importance, especially if you're doing an embolization, whether it be a thoracic branch or, a, uh, or the bronchial artery, is stable base catheter access, right, Shelly? And why is that important? Oh my gosh. When your base catheter isn't in a nice position that's nice and stable in the ostia, it can be so painful when you're trying to get more distal into that artery. Um, you buckle yourself out and then you're back to square one where you're trying to find that artery again. And then, you know, there was a case when I was a fellow where they did not have stable access and they were in the process of embolization and maybe a little bit too aggressive with those, whatever they're using, embospheres. And uh, the, the patient suffered temporary blindness. Some of those embospheres got, got back, you know, and oh shot up in the vertebral. Gosh. Yeah. And so that's mm -hmm. the other key important thing. That's why, you know, you see cases like that and you just, it's like going to m, &M You just, it burns in your memory. And so that's why, you know, even as tenuous as it might be, like I, I have to make sure I have stable base catheter access and get that uh, microcatheter as far as I can, just because the patient can, you know, suffer significant complications from what seems like a straightforward procedure. 
I mean, that's a that's an excellent point. I think when we're doing microcatheter work, we tend to be so focused, magged in, focusing on one area. It's really important to think about a couple of things where you kind of want to have the screen opened up and demag just enough so hopefully you might be able to see your base catheter. But the other thing you have to remember is when you're advancing microcatheters and you're so far away from your base, when you're not getting one to one pushing with that microcatheter, like you're pushing and it's not moving, stop and look back. Cause a lot of times now you've either dislodged your base catheter or your microcatheter is looping somewhere far. So just think about if I'm pinning the wire and pushing the micro and it's not moving, something ain't right. Cause you don't want to give up what you just did, which might recreate the whole process or you might get into a complication. Um, all right. Well, so moving on, let's get down into the lumbar aorta. Selecting lumbars, honestly, <laughs> when I'm looking for those mesenterics, you know, commonly we'll be selecting lumbars because I'm on the wrong side. But of course, when you're trying to select the lumbars, then you're selecting the mesenterics. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, I, but I, I don't know, you know, my go to in the lumbar aorta is, a, is you know, a C2 from the get go. But um, let's start with the mesenterics because that's probably the most common thing we're trying to select for a GI bleed or, or something like that. What's your go-to for celiac, SMA, IMA? Shelly, I'll start with you. So that's interesting that you mentioned that the C2 is your go-to. I wonder if this is just dependent on, you know, culture of your institution. We're at Rush. We always start with the sauce. The sauce is kind of like our power finder when it comes to the abdominal aorta. When we're looking for celiac, SMA, um, IMA, it's not always as easy to use the sauce. And we end up switching out for other things. But if you're having any trouble with the sauce or you feel like that reverse curve is working against you and not giving you the stability you need, then the Cobra is usually the next step for us. I'll tell you, there's a, there's a reason why certain places may have uh, reasons because we, when you give a lot of latitude to trainees, you find out what all damage you can cause with certain things in the past. <laughs> so historically, um, the Cobra, the Cobra, which is like that nice arching kind of double curve almost, it's a great catheter and it does especially in the superior mesenteric, it really helps you anchor in there because the SMA is one that quite often when you do a sauce and you do a power injection, it pops out. The Cobra helps you. But the one thing that you have to understand about Cobra is it, you can damage the aorta and the ostium of vessels very easily if you're not careful. So with the sauce, people tend to push, pull, just re-anchor. With the Cobra, the way it's angled, you're going to potentially scrape plaque off. You're going to perforate. You're going to dissect. So for a safety sake, since we care about patients primarily first, as we all should, certain people will be more heavy on certain ones and then switch to it when you're having trouble because the greatness of certain devices also come with a cost if you're not careful. So I think that's why. But I agree with the Cobra being a fantastic catheter for the renals, for the main missiles that we do probably day to day. It's just the sauce kind of has a little bit more safety and works just fine. Also, the sauce, or sometimes I'll use a Mickelson if I have to get into the left gastric or the uh, inferior phrenics because the left gastrics and the uh, inferior phrenics comes really early off the aorta or off the celiac, and the cobra will never get you into those. So when you're doing visceral interventions, in interventional oncology or bleeders, you often have to get into left gastric and the cobra will never get you into that. So in those situations, the sauce, once you engage the celiac and you pull down, a lot of times it angles right into the gastric. Same thing, a Mickelson, you pull down on the celiac, you keep pulling gently as you're injecting. Sometimes it'll just straighten out a flip in there. So you have to think about what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to get to, and what's going to give you the most success in those. Yeah, that was my next question. Come on, you already answered it. It's perfect for the phrenics and the left gastric. Renals, what are you using when you're trying to get into a renal to stop a bleed, for example? Yeah, pretty much for the renals, normally it's going to be a cobra. For the most part, there is the RDC, which is a renal double curve, which is some people may choose just because it, it was kind of designed for that. When you have a really acute uh, renal angle, then the uh, renal double curve catheter are going to help. But a Cobra, for the most part, the hard thing about renals and with the Berenstein sometimes is the Berenstein doesn't have that long of an angled tip. So when you're in the aorta, it's not going to give you an ability sometimes to to get over to that side of the artery. So um, if it goes in with a Bernie, then that's fantastic, or Berenstein. Otherwise, quite often it's going to be a Cobra. Sometimes a Sim, if for some reason some people have a hard time. But I think with the RDC and other ones, you can really get that angle to get that downward angle hooked or, you know, other approaches. Yeah, because like the renal is going to be, I mean, unlike, for example, the SMA, which is going to be much more of an acute angle, renal is going to be 90 for the most part, roughly. And so, yeah, I think that's where I actually have 
probably the most luck with the cobra getting it right away is just because that angle is right it's almost like right on with with the cobra and just to back up the difference between the c1 and the c2 which are the two most common cobras that are out there it's a slightly different angle i mean that's the same thing with like all these variations you know there's sauce one two three in the case of the sauce it's size wise you know the one's a little bit shorter than the two and the three with the cobra the difference between the the one two and the three is they're just slightly different angles that all have that sort of cobra shape like the snake that's why they're named that way but yeah for whatever reason the most common one that i see in my private practice hospitals is the c2 it might be cost or it might be bundling or whatnot but yeah the, for the renals I totally agree and then if it's some funny angle then i go with the reverse curve but yeah c2 tends to be my go-to and I, i'm pretty successful with it the thing with that you got to be careful at, and for you know the ones who are kind of getting nuances when you push that c2 into it remember it's curved down so if you're not too careful this is what i was talking about with the viscerals you're going to be scraping the bottom aspect of that artery so you don't want to really be pushing it too far into it because anytime you're pushing a cobra, you should be either using a wire or puffing contrast or saline to make sure it's bouncing off the wall. Because otherwise, if you have heavy plaque, disease, whatever, you're, you're basically, it's scraping along it. And it's probably the best place to use a glide cath too, right? I mean, just because a lot of times you do have a lot of atherosclerotic plaque at that origin. Get a glide cath in there so that you're not worried about causing a dissection or screwed up and like you suggested earlier that that'd be a case where you'd use a longer sheath too especially if you're placing a stent like we get these huge rccs that they want us to embolize and you know you're going to be in there for a while you just get a nice long sheath up there get stable access that's a great tip and also the tip deflecting sheets often will be needed in, in some of these cases where it can help you get closer off that artery origin when you have a big aorta a big tortuous aorta i'm um, having that as a backbone to redirect you and that's the other key thing is like a lot of times these patients, you know, they've got big aneurysms too. And so what are you going to do with that kind of anatomy? Other than the C2, like there is an actual renal selective catheter. Have you guys ever used it? I saw it written out and I looked it up and I was surprised because I haven't used it at Rush before. <laughs> and if you have access to every toy that you want, which we, we're very lucky, but I mean, I think that's something great to have and it might help you. But I think a lot of us have some of the ones that we use the most and then use that. And if it doesn't work, we have other ways to get into it. But if you're a purist, you should try to use what, what all has been designed. And, you know, somebody spent a couple of years of their life trying to come up with a shape. That design, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's great. It'll probably help you save a few minutes if you use that instead. It's just when you think about supplies and what all you can have, um, sometimes stuff. Aaron, you mentioned that you use reverse curve, like if the cobra kind of is a hard time. I know I've had my sauce hook into renals before. Is that kind of what your go-to is? or? Yeah. Yeah, it would be a sauce. Yeah, for sure. One thing I've done before is I've, and Cook may want me to cut this out, but is you take a <laughs> catheter and you improvise, right? Yep. So you take something like a rim and you cut it right at the halfway part, or just enough where it's more than like a Berenstein. And you can sometimes get that to hook, especially when it's like a downward facing renal and get that to kind of hook in there. And that's just when I just can't, I, I start doing that after like my third or fourth catheter. I'm just like, let me just try to make something on my own that seems to fit this shape. I mean, the, the, the podcast is called back table. So back table modifications <laughs> are, yeah, should be allowed. Right? Think about adrenal <laughs> main sampling, what all we do. And, you know, uh, for the, yeah. even the aortic bifurcation sometimes, or when I do if I flip a arterial axis, I'll, I'll modify a, a hairpin, you know? So, um, those are all technically off label, but just understand that as you do more complex things, these are how new catheters, shapes, devices were formed was by figuring out how can I accomplish this goal here? It's one of my favorite parts of IR is MacGyvering catheters and, you know, making it work for what you need. Exactly. I mean, how many holes do we create in catheters or even just drainage catheters where you're constantly altering these things and we should be allowed to, right? I mean, it's whatever's best for that patient, for that situation. It is unfortunate that we can't just have a Bunsen. I don't know. Maybe it's for the better, but <laughs> it, it was, it sounds cool when you hear about the old guys that used to just shape them on their own with a Bunsen burner on the back table, you know? Speaking of old guys, a little trivia, Shelly, do you know how, what the first kind of catheterization was? I know there's no, I mean, unless you read about it. The first catheterization? Yeah, to the heart. Oh, no. 
Yeah, it's a cool story. Aaron, you probably know this, but uh, I think it was, what is it? In the early 1900s, there was a physician in Germany who said, um, I'm going to try and put this catheter in my arm in a vein. So he took a Foley, basically a urinary catheter. He convinced his nurse that, uh, she said, I'll, I'll give you some supplies if you do it on me. I don't want you to do it on yourself. So he said, sure. He strapped her down to a table, pretended to do a sham procedure on her, then took it and put it into his antecubital vein. Once he stuck it in there, he unstrapped her and they walked to radiology and they watched it go all the way to the right ventricle. His name is Dr. Frostman. First ever uh, vascular catheterization. And then from there, obviously, we know things that went on with, with Dotter and with uh, Grunzig and everybody else kind of finding ways to actually do things properly. <laughs> you said he took a Foley catheter? It was basically a urinary catheter into his antecubital vein and shoved it in <laughs> I mean, we're sitting here thinking about, like, how do I get this 014 wire all the way from the yeah. <laughs> Wow. That's incredible. No, I hadn't heard that, Kumar. Yeah. And so they, so he just knew that, okay, I can inject this contrast. Yeah, he was like, he got it in there. He's like, it, it's got a lead there. I can track it there. So it was going, and then they had to walk over to radiology, which is like another department section area of the hospital, and uh, do like, you know, image flat plates or whatever as they inject and check. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah, that's wild. It had to have been big. It was, it was a urinary catheter. It's I mean, bigger than a pick line. That's all I know. He must I mean. have had, yeah. <laughs> he must have had some juicy veins. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking of like the movie scene when you have like, you know, the physician strapping his nurse down to a table. Oh, yeah. And he pretended to like inject lidocaine and all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I mean, I've just thought about how cool of a story that is. Yeah. yeah. All right. I do have some questions for challenging cases. Uh, one from Sabine, but before, real quick, we talked a little bit about aortic bifurcation and pelvic branches. Shelly, we already talked about forming a SIMS, but can you talk about a Waltman's loop just real quick and how we would use that to select and navigate like a, a torturous iliac? So the Waltman's loop, I mean, that isn't a technique that we've used at Rush, but it is something that I looked into where you basically take a catheter. Is it like a Berenstein catheter or something that like is more of a simple curve? And then you're able to create a reverse curve up into the aorta by like pushing it upwards. And then it can help you select like a left gastric, I think is my impression of it. Yeah, a lot of people use it with a suture to try to help you do like ipsilateral procedures when you have one catheter going from one growing up and over. You'd sometimes get it up there, you'd pull on the suture to help it bring it down. People have done iterations where they take and push, but I mean, most people would use it for uh, the iliac arteries kind of selecting and coming back. You know, Aaron, for us, we tend to use just the Ruck, which became the RBT now when it came back. The Robertson, which, you know, Shelly, I don't know if he knows, but Dr. Ann Roberts, one of the pioneers in IR, one of our female IRs was still out in California. She designed that. You know, the one we use for uterine fibroid embolization. It's that catheter that took away the need for any really need to do a Waltman loop type procedure because from a single groin axis, we can treat up and over, we push the catheter up, turn it, come down, and it's the quickest way I've ever seen in my hands to do a femoral artery approach uterine embolization. It literally, the catheter itself tends to hook the uterines for you. Wait, so people are still doing the Waltman loop? I might be showing my age here. Air is yeah. old school, you know? Oh, wow. I had no idea. I really thought the rock <laughs> yeah. must be a universal <laughs> catheter. Oh, my gosh. It's kind of like, it's like pointless to even bring it up on this podcast because nobody does anymore. But no, history is important. No, no. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's how we did our UFIs is we formed a Waltman's loop. I typically I think it was even just a C2. We'll put it over the aortic bifurcation. And then you take your wire, you, you get it down there, like, I don't know, past the branch into the external iliac. And then you take the back end of a wire, any wire, and you put it up towards the arch. So you basically push the arc of the catheter up into the aorta, and then you turn it. So that the the tip of the catheter is actually pointed towards your ipsilateral iliac, common iliac, and then you bring everything down, and then you just twist it, and it automatically almost selects that internal iliac. Then we'd put our microcatheter through, and then do your ipsilateral UFI. Yeah, that was how I learned to do UFIs, and so hmm. I guess I didn't realize there was a a new. Oh yeah, the Roberts uterine catheter, which is the Ruck is amazing like that's the only thing i've seen used at rush and it really and it's like dr manisario was saying it's like a magnet for the internal iliacs which it sounds like the waltman's loop is as well when i had looked up the waltman's loop i did see the literature saying 
use that technique for the left gastric. Is that something you've seen? You can do that too, because it's just changing the angle of the catheter tip. So like, like Kumar was saying, it's like that gets like that left gastric is all about the, the angle of the tip going up into that left gastric. And so you could push that whole Waltman's loop up into the aorta and then select it that way. And so, yeah, you're right. You basically created a sense of like a Sim or a Mickelson with that catheter. So um, you're just using any catheter and, and making it a big double, like reverse curve. But the, the ruck, you know, what's funny is uh, Aaron, you know, cause we're all social media friends um, and, and we have a big family. I remember somebody reached out from, from Africa, an IR, and he was talking about it. And I said, oh, just use the RBT. He goes, what's the RBT? I'm like, well, that's what came back as the ruck and Cook has it. And I go, that's, that's literally the only one we use. Now I do have some older partners who'll use just an Omni and I know it's crazy, but use just an Omni flush to do both internal iliacs. Um, and it does work. And I've done it back in the days when, uh, some things went off market or was back ordered. You can still even use an Omni for bilateral uterine and artery embolization. So you can do anything with these as long as you know how to use these things. But I'll tell you when I'm training a trainee, I can get them to use an RBT within one case or two cases a lot faster than, um, you know, the floor radiation time with the other stuff. Yeah. You got to keep, keep an eye on that. Cause yeah, you're going to cause trauma. And for those that don't know the ruck or the RBT, basically all you need is to get an up and over wire into the contralateral iliac, external iliac or common femoral, and then you advance this catheter. And the way Dr. Roberts and Roberts created it, there's a hinge point at the top of this huge, long reverse curve. So that when you get that hinge point over the aortic bifurcation, now you can go into the internal on that contralateral side, do your anterior division and the uterine. And then as you push the catheter up, now it's going up in the aorta and the catheter tip is going to go up, 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 and then you come and just twist and come down the ipsilateral side. If you just puff contrast, usually you can select the internal iliac, the anterior division, and quite often right into the uterine. So to me, it's like how people say a, a transradial UFI so fast. I mean, with an RBT in the groin, it's faster or equally fast. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, these are great tips. I'm going to get into some of the questions for challenging cases. Sabine wanted to ask, so you want to know left gastric and IMA can be tough to cath if there are stenoses, any shape that can help. And, you know, the IMA, I kind of glossed over it when we talked about mesenterics, but I think it's the most challenging vessel to catheterize. And so if you guys have any tips for IMA for like a GI bleed. I mean, one that I've seen a couple of times that worked for me is the rim catheter. That nice curve kind of can help back you into that origin. Yeah. The I and the M in the word rim is for inferior mesenteric. So the reason why that catheter has that name is because it was kind of designed to help you with that. So some people use it actually, I know other specialists sometimes use that catheter for up and over aortoiliac alone, but that catheter has that nice, short, tight curve on it that when you're coming down that, that IMA comes just above the aortoiliac bifurcation. So if you oblique your, your imager and you do a run, you'll quite often see the origin if it's not heavily diseased or stenosis. And as you're coming down with that rim, um, you're able to hook it. But I'll usually start first with just a sauce. Quite often, you'd be surprised if you just kind of torque and angle as you come down, you'll be able to catch it. And if that doesn't work, then I'll try something else. I would say if you're having trouble, truly, you can do a, a good DSA run and an oblique a little bit off center. And you might often find it. But between the sauce and the rim, um, it's usually very feasible. Now, sometimes it might be so tight that you got to get um, a glide wire or even a micro catheter through your base catheter to try to get in there. But those are kind of step one, two, three for me on those. But they are challenging. And make sure it's actually there. Make sure it's there. Make sure it's not occluded. And, you know, if they had a CTA, take a look at the CTA and you don't even need to mess around with the IMA if there's no bleed there. So, exactly. You know, I think it was old school teaching, Kumar, for me is just like, you have to do three vessel, you know, celiac, SMA, IMA for all GI blades, but then CTAs got way better. And it's like, no, you don't. No, that's exactly how I was taught. If you didn't check all of them, they'll say you didn't complete that procedure. Yeah. 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 But I, I, you know, now that CTAs are, are much better and if you can actually see the bleed, there's no point in checking them unless you just don't see anything. Back in your time, Aaron, it was all, it was all wet films. So, you know, you had to wait, go, you had to run to, you had to go run, process the film, hang it on the That's wall, right. get the dark goggles on it. <laughs> That's right. We were there for all night for yeah. one GI bleed. That's why you lost all your fingers, you know, back in the days. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. So Sabine had some more questions for you. Of course Kumar. he did. He of, course know, he did. Yeah. of course he did. Of course Sabine did. He wants to know, 
What about tough up and over access for legs, like a really torturous bifurcation? Any tips for that? Yeah. Shelly, I don't know if you've been in any of the really tough up and over. Have you, do you have you, do you remember any cases like that? Honestly, I feel like a majority of our cases doing an omni flush, like kind of getting up and over with the Benson or a glide wire through the omni, like helps a lot. For the really difficult ones, I mean, very rarely I've seen you pull out the rim catheter to, to get us up and over. Or sometimes if you're able to get a wire just a little bit over that arch and if you're having a hard time advancing the wire, getting more distally, then you switch to a crossing catheter to like help you advance that wire to get more stable. Yeah, I think, I think it depends on what you think is the reason why you're having trouble. If it's because of a steeped bifurcation versus a tortuous heavily diseased bifurcation, that's going to be, I think my mindset. So I usually always start with an Omni. If I can get a wire down all the way up and over into the common femoral or SFA on the other side, and if the Omni is not going, then I switch to a straighter catheter, either a straight flush or a glide catheter, or sometimes like Shelly said, a crossing, like a recanalization support catheter, because those are all smaller, smaller. If it's for a really difficult case, then you can try a tip deflecting sheath up and over to kind of help you anchor it to get your wire support all the way down. Because sometimes all you can get up and over is a, a glide wire, which is not supported for much of anything. So you might need something else. If it's super difficult and nothing's really working, what I'll do in those situations, I'll stick the contralateral common femoral artery retrograde. I'll keep a small 018 access. I'll get that wire up and I'll put a bareback snare. I'll grab the wire from the aorta I'll bring it down. Now I have a flossing access to then advance my catheter and sheath up and over. And then all I had was an 018 hole, like a micropuncture hole. Um, I've done that, you know, a few times where nothing else is working. And it's not a case where I can just go antegrade down the leg. Otherwise, I'd prefer to do that anyway. Those are kind of my steps is either get a smaller catheter, a more hydrophilic catheter to go up and over if I have good wire access, even a glide wire. If not, switch to a support catheter and then put a stiffer wire through a support catheter. Because once you get a stiff Amplat, super stiff, whatever, Lunderquist, then usually anything will go over it as long as you practice riding the sheath over the dilator right before you get to the arch. That's the one thing that people still mess up. They'll get a wire, even a stiff wire, and they're advancing their sheath, and all of a sudden now their wire goes up in the aorta. Usually it's because that dilator is stiff and it's tapered down. So as you're pushing, it becomes a little bit of a spear. So it's going to push your wire at the bifurcation straight up. So when you get to that aortic arch, you just peel off the sheath from the dilator, let that go over. And once you get the sheath over, then you put the dilator back all the way. And those little things will help those difficult things. And Sabine needs a lot of help in most of his cases. <laughs> That's a good tip. <laughs> Sabine, I hope you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> Sabine, just call Shelly. I just FaceTime Shelly when you need help. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, That's a great, man. That's great. All right, so to finish up, we don't need to talk about flush catheters. Everybody kind of knows when and how to use those. I mean, there's you know, your pigtail and you got your sauce omni flushes. We're typically using them in the aorta, in the major vessels. I don't know, any tips on flush catheters? I don't... Just remember if you're using a flush catheter and then you put a wire through, especially glide wire or something like that, just remember that a lot of times you may be going through the side holes. So there's been times where I've been called into cases because, you know, that's the fun part of training people is that uh, something's stuck, something's not going right, something right. That's because now you have a stiff wire through somehow through a side hole of a catheter and now it's stuck and it's not going. So just be very mindful of thinking about where things are happening um, when you have a side hole flush catheter. But flush catheters, make sure that you remember that you can go really high on your pressure. Check the guy, check the books, but you can go 900, you can go 1,000 PSI on those. Um, Because as you come down with different types of catheters, when you're doing power injections, you have to lower your pressure they're not built for that. But flush catheters are meant to give you an incredible jet stream effect of that contrast. And that's what you should be using for your diagnostic angiograms, if you can, for the aorta, for the legs, the omni flush, the straight flush, the pigtail flush. Those are all catheters that are meant to give you great images compared to what you can um, with the others. Yeah. I've never seen that happen, Kumar, but that is good advice to go through a side hole. But also, just make sure you unfurl it before you pull it out, right? Especially if you're in the heart. But it, really, if you're anywhere, you just want to get that wire all the way through, unfurl it before you remove that catheter. We'll use those pigtail flushes when we're going into the pulmonary arteries because sometimes, you know, some people like to use the APT2 or create one 
with a pigtail flush with the back end of a Benson that's bent. So, you know, when you're doing those kind of things, just be careful and remember where you are with those uh, in terms of the loop. Oh, that's a great tip to create one with a regular. So that's, that's, you know, you're talking about old school era. That's how, yeah. uh, that's how, that's how <laughs> our, uh, that's how our former predecessors all got trained. A lot of them, they take a uh, Benson wire at the back end of it and they bend it a few centimeters from the origin. And you take your pigtail, you put that in your right atrium. And then what they do is when they put the back end that's bent, that pigtail now becomes bent. So now they, they form like, you know, what we use now, like an APT2, which is basically an angled pigtail. And they use that to push and twist. I mean, never push the wire out of the, the flush catheter, obviously, because now you have a sharp end. But um, that's what I was actually taught originally by one of my partners now when I was a resident was to use that method. Well, that's great because, they, yeah, some of these places don't even have the angled pigtails. What's the other one? It starts with a G. Grohlman. Grohlman, yeah. yeah, yeah the Grohlman yeah. or the, yeah. And that's a tough thing because once a lot more people are using big, large devices in the pulmonaries, you want to be very careful because... If you've done enough of these earlier on, you know what you have to watch out for when you get your catheter through uh, one of the cords of the of the valves and, you know, perforate things and now you have pericardial effusion and death. You can avoid all that with the proper technique. And one of those is uh, knowing how to use these catheters to navigate. If you use just, you know, a berencine or something to get into the main pulmonary artery, that's probably okay to just do a quick picture. But when you're putting in a 20 French, 20, whatever device, you don't know what you went through. So that's why I think people have reverted back to remembering how to use a, a pigtail to get up there or a swan or pushing a Fogarty over a wire after you've gotten access just to make sure before you put this big garden holes up there that uh, you didn't ca cause a problem. That's a great point. Okay, so speaking of venous cases, the last two I wanted to talk about before we finish up are access catheters for tips. And then we, we kind of talked a little bit about adrenal vein stimuli, but we can touch on the right the right adrenal, since we already talked about the left adrenal. But it's for tips, I usually will use like just like the multi-purpose or a hockey stick. But sometimes the angle's tricky, right? Shelly, what's your go-to for tips getting into this into that right hepatic? Yeah, for the hepatic vein, similarly, the NPA is our go-to. And have like pretty reasonable success with that. Yeah, we'll go MPA as a primary thing that we have open for every even transjugal liver biopsy, because you have to get to the same vein for those things. My method is usually MPA. And by the way, MPB is kind of like an MPA, but it has side holes at the tip of it. But MPA is all you need for those situations. But if the MPA doesn't go and there's some nuances to remember how to get in there, and most often it's because people aren't high enough because you're seeing the heart and you're thinking, oh, wait, I'm too high, but really you're not there yet because the hepatic confluence is probably a little higher. But if that doesn't work, then I'll go to Cobra, a C2. But the problem with that is when you get high up near that confluence, you're going to pop into the right atrium easily. My last go-to ditch effort that I'm not sure if many people use is a launcher. It's kind of a coronary catheter, but what it is, is basically it's a, imagine like a sauce, but upside down. So basically when you put this catheter down and you form it in the IVC, now it comes with a catheter like, so it's got like a question mark with a flat line. So what happens is when you come up now with that catheter and it's got this question mark, as it's coming up towards the heart, that kind of horizontal tip will catch the right hepatic vein. So that's my last go-to. The problem with that is you can't really advance it into the hepatic vein. If nothing's working, I'll use that to get a wire down and then switch out to another. But honestly, that saved me a few times when nothing else was working. Okay. What's it called again? The launcher catheter. The launcher. Okay. It's a cool name too. When you ask for it, like, give me the launcher. Like, they're like, what? <laughs> the launcher. I said, damn it. No. <laughs> Dude, yeah. a countdown. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I make them do a rocket sound. Yeah. In the beginning, I remember in the beginning of the year, we I was doing a transjugular liver biopsy and um, having a tough time getting into the right hepatic. And that was such a nice case because we tried everything. We tried the MPA, we tried the Cobra, and everything just kept buckling out. And I remember when he asked for the launcher, everyone in the room was like, what? And the tech came back, it took a few minutes to find it, but it actually nicely seated us into the right hepatic, and then we were able to complete the case shortly thereafter. You know, one thing important for trainees is when we talked about walking around and looking at supplies, walk around to the other specialty supplies too. Um, a lot of things that everybody's adopted from IR has come from understanding the shapes and the lengths and the uses that other people are using. I mean, we learn in transradial how to use Sarah's and Jackie's for viscerals because of the coronary catheters, right? That's where they're from. So if you just rely on what you have, you'll never be able to 
improvise in situations, which is what our specialty kind of is about. So understanding what all is out there and when you can use it, I've learned different things. I use the Penumbra Select long catheter for UFIs from the radio because it just made sense for me from a neuro standpoint. Like they use it for that and it's long and it's nice. So you never know what you're going to use, but um, understand the shapes, why, how. I think that's important. Well, you just made a great point, Kumar. And, and I realized this whole discussion has been centered around femoral access. It's all about where you're coming from, right? So if you're coming from radio or you're coming from IJ, it's going to be a completely different angle. And I mean, we, we just talking about tips. We're talking about coming from the IJ, but last one that I want to talk about is the right adrenal, which is maybe next to, if not equal to the IMA as one of the most frustrating vessels to catheterize. What does y'all's go to for a, a right adrenal? So, I mean, you can use uh, either a sauce with some exercise holes. You can use a Cobra, a Sim. The problem with a Sim sometimes I think with that is, and again, I preferentially and luckily don't have to do a lot of these. But the problem with the sim sometimes it, it gets you too far deep into it um, because of how long that, that front end is. So I think having something else like a sauce or a cobra may have a better shot when you make extra side holes because you need to be able to get the uh, aspirate through it with a check floor or whatever else you use in there. It depends, again, how far you are off your uh, IVC wall, being able to hook that. I, I think I think personally the, the right adrenal is probably harder than any other vein. <laughs> It is, man. it is yeah. incredibly yeah. frustrating and challenging. Yeah. How about you? What are you using? Me? Uh, thankfully, I haven't had to do a right adrenal <laughs> in a long time. It's similar to you, it's nice. I passed that off to somebody else. But from what I remember, it was always you know try cobra first, then sauce. That was sort of the algorithm. One of our one of our IR friends in Canada, Bao, he always talks about. Um, oh yeah. He always talks about he puts a micro wire, micro catheter to kind of offset the catheter so it's not stuck against the wall. So he keeps that in there as kind of like a little balancing act so that you're actually within the lumen and have a lot better access in there. Okay. And then it, what does he, he just aspirates through the microcatheter? I think Bao just stares at it and somehow it works. Um, <laughs> he's a magician, but uh, he has yeah. usually like a, a, a tui in the back. Okay. Um, so he has kind of dual access approaches there. Uh, interesting. All right, guys. Well, that's a Lots of great tips and tricks you guys provided. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Anything I left out? You know, I think it's interesting because not a lot of people think, and I'm glad you guys took some time and effort to talk about catheters. If you think about what the process was probably like when, you know, Frostman is putting a, a Foley catheter's armor, Ben Franklin put a some kind of metal tube in his brother for bladder stones, and where we are now, our daughter and, you know, Bill Cook became best friends to to improvise on his plumbing interests. It's incredible where we are at now. And I think it's important to take some time to understand the beauty of these products. There's a lot of effort that goes into these. If you ever go visit any of these companies and see how these things are made, which a lot of people should do if you get into this, it's incredible what goes on when you just open this little thing and, you know, not me, but somebody drops it and they're like, oh, let's give me another one. You don't think about what all went into that process. And also all the time I have juniors being like, wow, like, how did you, how do you know this? Or how, like, how did you get there? And it's really just time. And I can't like impress enough on like any juniors who might be listening to this podcast, feeling really overwhelmed with how many catheters we went over. That's just going to come with time and experience and doing more cases and seeing more cases and everyone will get there. Yeah. And, and for like the trainees, as you get older is, is take the time. Like I remember some of my like junior attendings and fellows that they would draw like what a Cobra looks like and what vessels it can access and really drew it on a whiteboard for me so that I could visualize it instead of having to look it up in a textbook. And so the power of teaching goes a long way too. just, you know, five minutes at the end of the case, just saying, Hey, do you know why we use that catheter? Stuff like that. So thank you so much guys. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and uh, thank you to our audience for tuning in again. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for the wonderful AV technology support from everybody. And thanks, Sabine, <laughs> for, for staying off mic and camera. I'm sure hiding somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. He's just listening, laughing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. 
Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Louis Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening.